take two of this recording today. Last week it uh, messed up and now it messes up again. So I'm going to try to, I'm not trying to be indelicate, but I'll go through this again, but hopefully it'll work. Uh, I'll give you the announcements and we'll get right into the, the sermon. So uh, a couple of things. Work is continuing here at the church. We've had some folk come up and do some electrical work and we've had some other people there cleaning up the uh, sidewalks, the steps, the driveways and everything. It looks like a brand new parking lot. It looks phenomenal. And some men have been up there doing that as well as a young lady came up uh, and helped her husband today. And I'm so very grateful for that. Uh, there are still some more things to do around the church. If you would like to come up and are caught up on your honeydews and you're looking to change up the the church dues come on up here and we got some things that we can go through you go through with you um finishing up tomorrow with the book of acts so you should be uh next to the tomorrow should be the last chapter of that and uh, of our reading together with that offices are still going to be closed for the next couple of weeks uh which leads me to an announcement next uh, or this coming up Wednesday in a few days, we're going to have our church council meeting here in the gym at five o'clock. If you are a committee chair, if you are a committee chair of whatever committee, I don't care what committee it is, we have it set up to where every chairperson comes of representing that ministry and comes and discusses things of the church and what we're doing, what we plan to doing. And there are some things that uh, we need to discuss as a group and lift up in prayer. So please make time to be a part of that at five o'clock. We're going to space out enough so that there's social distancing. We'll have hand uh, sanitizers, wash your hands, all that. If you feel ill, stay home. That's fine. Or send somebody in your stead as a representative of your uh, ministry or committee. So with that, I will do this again. Let me share the screen with you. And hopefully this will work just fine. So if you would have your Bibles to Luke chapter 6, verse 37 to 45. And I'll begin reading there. Luke chapter 6, 37 to 45. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? No. Will they not both fall into a pit? Yes. A disciple is not above a his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take out the log of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Verse 43. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Let's pray. Father God, add your blessings to us as we have read through this scripture and guide my words as we seek to exalt you and apply these words to our lives and our ministries. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thankfully, Jesus gives us the theme to this particular text right off the bat. It's simple, commonly known, and yet confusing to some. Do not judge. If you're a secularist, you like to throw out scriptures, throw this scripture out at Christians or quote church people. There are even Christians today that go through 
this verse and misuse the statement of, I don't judge people. Let me ask you this. If I'm beating my wife or doing something so obviously immoral, will you not cast a judgment on my actions? Because let me say, if you're forgoing your right to judge me for immoral actions, then that's good news for me. And any other believers in the world, because we can just go about our merry way and not worry about if anybody's going to say anything to it. So you continue on with that idea that I don't judge people. So let, let me ask you this then. Based on what I just shared with you, do you judge or not? Now, that is a quick way to get through this particular scripture. Just we judge or we don't judge. But there's way more to unpack regarding the specifics of how and when and even if we should judge. There are three things that make, that take, uh, that must take place before we can righteously judge another human being. There's actually only one thing that we actually judge. And we'll see that as we go through. So right off the bat, first thing, have a generous heart. It is in our nature to judge someone immediately when there is wrongdoing. And let me say, it is in our nature to put the hammer down hard. If a member of the congregation or another congregation or somewhere else in the world does something wrong, and I'm not speaking of capital offenses or anything like that, I'm talking about an unkind word, pulling the door open for somebody in front of you and then letting it go right in front of your face. Right? Doesn't that just set you off? They must hate me. They must think the worst of me. Bam, 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 bam. It's something simple like that, not capital stuff. Capital stuff will say for another sermon because scripture does speak to that, but that's for another day. So maybe somebody says something to somebody else that you may not otherwise say to them, irregardless. They said it. What is the best response? He says it, and he's why by his saying, and you will not be judged. Did you catch it? Don't judge is the first thing. Don't do it. Just don't judge a person, especially if they just happen to open the door for somebody else and they let go of in front of you. One, you don't know the circumstances of it. Highly unlikely that they go to church here and then they're going to be standing at the door and just let the door go right in front of you. Surely that would be the wrong place to just be that type of uh, a person. I don't think that would be the case. But I don't know. But he says don't judge. Then the next option is to forgive because the effect would be that you yourself would be forgiven if the roles were reversed or if another circumstance comes down the line where you need that forgiveness or you're to be judged. Next is to give and it will be given to you. Jesus ex is explained to those who are listening <clears throat> that your generosity contributes to peaceful society where everyone is not seeking to chastise or judge so quickly. When you extend grace to others, grace will then be extended back. Be generous with forgiveness. You hear me? Be generous with forgiveness. Many tend to turn to this particular scripture concerning money. That is not so. Otherwise, it would be very easy for us to refer to Christ as ADHD, attention deficit disorder, which he is not. Christ did not begin the conversation with judgment and immediately start talking about money. That's not what happens. So if you're thumbing through scripture and looking at this particular verse and saying, well, here, I can give you some insight on money, on tithing, on all these, that, that's wrong. Don't do that. Don't use this scripture. That's taking it out of context. This particular, these particular two verses have everything to do with how we graciously treat other people, <clears throat> especially in times of judgment. If we would be moral in our judgment, then we must be generous towards others. If we're going to use morality to judge, we have to be generous when we're judging others. The first step to a righteous judgment is acquiring the right posture of heart. Generous, charitable judgment. Number two, be careful who you follow. 
This comes in verse 39 through 40. For years and years and years, I listened to one particular uh, radio talk show host who was big into politics. It was around the time uh, when Clinton was office. Uh, this person did not like the president whatsoever. As a matter of fact, you could see it because back then they televised it late at night. And anytime the president was brought up, you'd see the face turn red, Bane stick out in his neck and just get mad and angry, just go at it. And I enjoyed this show. I enjoyed listening to the stuff about politics, everything going on in the world. I listened to it. Not because the person was angry and I was just entertained by the anger. No, I, the content for me was good. But if you listen to the people that call in and everything to these shows, you can kind of get that they all seem to be kind of frustrated. Now, even throughout the rest of my life, I would hear people interact in speaking of politics, politicians, specific parties. I noticed similar facial expressions and mannerisms from whoever, whoever was speaking. For a time, I even displayed those same facial expressions and mannerisms. It even got to the point when conversations about politics became almost the only thing that would come out of my mouth. So I was an angry, political, idealist redneck who couldn't find anything else to talk about except these things. After noticing this, and even my own father telling me, you gotta cut that out. He told me, you gotta stop watching, turn it off. And I actually stopped listening around 2012. You know what happened around 2012? Until about two years ago. Now, the difference is today, I know how to control my emotions regarding some of these things. And today, I do my absolute best to listen to both parties, every type of ideology. Not that it changes my fundamental beliefs, but because I know I have to interact with individuals in this congregation and community in the world, knocking on doors, talking to people out in public and anywhere and everywhere where they have different beliefs and different ideologies. My point is this. I became my leader, like my leader. I became a Christian in 2007, though I was a follower of Christ uh, whenever I became a Christian. I was also following this leader. I was displaying a Christ-like attitude mixed with a little bit of angry political idealist. If we follow people who are hypocritical and condemning, sooner or later, their manner becomes a part of our language and mannerisms. If we follow someone who always builds up, who shows kindness and humility, and then we will likewise learn to be compassionate, patient, and tender. Sound familiar? So, number three, deal with your own stuff. And this comes from verses 41 through 42. The third principle here is to deal with your own stuff. You cannot possibly deal with your neighbor's splinter or you have a beam sticking out of your eye. That is a beautiful picture of hypocrisy or how to be a, how to be a hypocrite. Verse 42 says that to take the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take out the splinter of your brother's eye. It does not say to take the beam out of your own eye and then don't worry about your brother. <clears throat> they can do it themselves. Morality requires we help one another with our failings. You hear me? Morality requires we help one another with our failings. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 through 2, if you don't believe me, says, brothers, if anyone is caught in, a tra in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Oh, there it is. Why we do, if we do any type of judgment, if we go and we uh, execute Matthew chapter 18 with a brother in Christ, we do it in the spirit of gentleness. When the scripture tells us that we are go to a brother who sinned against us, likewise, Christ also tells us that if we know that somebody has a problem with us, we leave our gift, we go deal with the problem. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 2 
solidifies the fact that we do it with a spirit of gentleness. It goes on to say, keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. Be, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So technically, in answering the question I asked earlier, if whether or not we judge one another is, essential, is essentially immoral to see a brother or sister in sin and not help. It is essentially immoral to see a brother or sister in sin and not help. Do you understand? And therein lies an issue. Everyone looks, everyone looks at judging one another's actions as simply an evil act. It's not an act of help. But it is. We have to keep that in the forefront of our minds. When someone comes to us with a judgment against our sinfulness, it is a matter of help. Again, Galatians 6 verse 1, if they're doing it in a spirit of gentleness. If you didn't do that, you're doing it wrong, and you're going to cause even more damage. If you're not, your spirit is not genteel, there's a little redneckery for you. If you do not have a genteel spirit before you go and speak to them, don't go. You're going to cause an even bigger problem. That's my little side rant to that. We have to keep that in the front, the forefront of our minds. That little box with the prayers right there in scripture. In our minds, when someone comes to us with a judgment against our sinfulness, it is a matter of help to move us away from that sinful lifestyle. Think of that beam in this way. What if the beam was actually a splinter? When when you have something that is right in front of your eyes, it takes on the appearance of a beam. So, now you understand how your vision is impaired when you have something consuming your life. It's right there. I hope I didn't give some of my fingerprints. Deal with it now. Get it out of the way so that you can deal with the problems of another. Don't wait. So, as you've completed all these, you are finally at the last part. You are finally ready to judge the heart. Well, I thought it was about judging, judging people. No. What we actually judge is the heart. Verse 43 to 45. After you have followed these steps, you can judge the heart. The world tells us that you cannot judge a person's heart. Apparently, judging a person's heart is considered the most immoral thing we could do. You may think that the heart is a secret place. But I am telling you today, it is not a secret. And everyone shares their heart openly, without reservation. Half the time, people don't even realize they're doing it. Christ, the great moral teacher, explains that a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Likewise, a good tree does not produce bad fruit. Verse 44. So, if we are, verse 44, so if we are known by our fruit, so we are known by the fruit we bear, I'll get it out. The so-called invisible things of the heart produces, are visible by actions and uh, your words, your words even. We cannot see into the heart, but that does not mean that the heart does not reveal itself. Words and actions revealed the person's heart. In the end, this means we cannot participate with people in our culture who loves separating their actions from their hearts. Some people love justifying the wrong actions by appealing to a good heart. Oh, well, I'm a good person. I have a good heart. And yet they're abusing people. They're going to court and saying, well, he's never done this kind of thing before. 
but it's in his heart or her heart or whatever the circumstance is. Jesus rejects that tendency. If the habit of a person's life is sin, then that person is a sinner. If the habit of a person's life is righteousness, then that person is, a, is righteous. The fruit reveals the root. Say it again. The fruit reveals the root. We will not discern or judge the hearts of others with any kind of clarity or accuracy unless we are first generous in our posture toward them and following some sound teaching ourselves and are eager to deal with our own stuff first, period. Until those things are true of us, we should not worry too much about others. Instead, we should fall on our knees for God asking for this kind of integrity and humility. A generous posture <clears throat> keeps us from being mean and stingy in our judgments. Following sound teaching helps us to know what is and is not moral. Dealing with our own sin creates compassion and integrity. The kind of person, this is the kind of person that dispenses righteous judgment. Here's a prayer moment. We should ask God in prayer for this kind of people to serve as judges, lawyers in our court systems, officers in our police forces. If anyone with responsibility deciding the outcome of people's lives. A prayer for ourselves should be that we want to be these kinds of people through Christ. So, a couple things. Consider your friends. Are they the kind of people who can evaluate your heart because they are generous toward others? Are careful about whom they follow? and first deal with their own sins, we must ask ourselves, can we accept their judgment when they give it to us? Or are we too proud when we fall into a pit of sinfulness and we'll just pat their hand away? No, I'll figure it out on my own. I'll get it out of this by myself. You need help to get out of the pits, to get out of the problems. Otherwise, you wouldn't have led yourself in there to begin with. Are we the kind of people described in verse 37 to 45? Um, this seems short. I apologize. This is a couple of times of me doing it. And hopefully this will be the last time for today. But ask yourself that last question. Are we the kind of people described in verse 37 to 45? Read it again and ask that. Can I pray for you? God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your words. God, if there's someone who's watching this or hearing this and does not know you, Father, you deliver them by your words, not me, for your sake, not me. This is all about you. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for my church family. I look forward to the day of getting to hug some necks and just being a good time of fellowship again, Father. We love you. We lift up our country, our president, all those who serve in Congress and in the Senate, all those who are in, who are in authorities. Thank you. We lift up all of the judges, the lawyers, the law enforcement officials. You work your spirit in them. And help us to be the type of people that you would want us to be. We love you. May I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love you. May God bless you as you stay.